Hello and welcome to the AMA Update video and podcast. It's that time of year again where medical students are starting to create their rank order list in preparation for this year's main residency match. And we're going to talk with Dr. Lou Edgy, the Associate Dean of Graduate Medical Education and Designated Institutional Official at the University of Cincinnati Medical School about her advice. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Welcome back, Dr. Edgy. It's a pleasure to have me back, and I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Well, we are moving into what can be a very stressful time for fourth-year medical students. They're beginning to submit their rank order lists on February 1st, and they have to finish that up by March 1st. Before we get into your specific advice on that, we've talked in the past about how during the pandemic, Students missed out on a lot of things like clinical rotations and in-person interviews that, you know, helped them determine uh, which residency programs would be right for them. Now that we are kind of where we are, are students and programs uh, having a kind of more normal experience uh, for match at this point? And if not, you know, are still seeing lingering effects from the pandemic? Absolutely. So you, you're right. I think uh, the pandemic did I guess, um, disadvantage uh, a fair number of our learners, especially in their fourth years, they're trying to do audition rotations, be in places that they think they may want to go ahead and, and um, finally do their residency. Um, that has opened up a little bit with um, rotations being allowed and a lot of institutions having external rotators um, in their spaces. Um, I will say that the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges did put out five recommendations for interviews to be virtual, um, again, the 22-23 year cycle, and uh, specifically that including um, local applicants, that those should also be virtual as well, and that they shouldn't have anything hybrid within a single program. Um, I think for the most part, um, applicants should be feeling a little bit more comfortable about their opportunities and their experience. We have seen application inflation though, that has been an issue. Uh, so for example, we've had some um, folks that are applying to 75 different programs, uh, which is not necessary and it can mm. be very debilitating to the program uh, directors. Wow, we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, that a little bit more. Uh, you know, as students and program directors, directors enter this phase, in your view, you know, what makes a good match and is there anything such as a perfect match? There is not a perfect match. Uh, there is the best match possible for the programs that you rank. And I think there's so many things that go into determining what that is. Um, I think virtual interviewing actually made it a little bit more difficult for uh, learners to get the organic experience and see um, residents in any program they're interviewing at interact with one another and really assess the culture. So when thinking about this kind of good match and what it looks like and then applying it to rank order lists, what criteria should students be considering? And I know, you know, some people subscribe to the go with your gut approach. Some are with, you know, follow your heart. What advice do you give students uh, in terms of your own philosophy? I am not a go by your gut kind of person until the very last minute when you've done all your great decision making. So I think it has to be very intentional along the way. Um, picking your programs, you have to have some intentionality there. And I think really align your values and um, you know your, your goals with those of the program. I think there should be a question rubric that you have that is pretty standard uh, that you use across all programs. And then really assess the responses that you got um, with those programs. Uh, and again, of course, um, the interactions you have with those who interview you are critical, important, uh, critically important in making sure um, you know whether you've got a fit there. You know, before we go into our next question, I, I did want to kind of circle back. You talked about this application inflation issue. I mean, are, uh, what what is driving that? And by the time you get to starting a rank order, I mean, are people dealing with pretty big lists at that point? Yeah. So the fact that Things are virtual. Um, we actually did a study back in um, 2012 about when Skype was a big thing um, and the pandemic was not on the horizon. And we found that it was really quite a bit more expensive for the students, um, both in time and resources, uh, money, uh, to go ahead and go to multiple programs. Certainly, I, I doubt there's a medical student who could um, afford going to 70 five in-person visits, not only the time taken from their schooling, but also the money to travel there. You pretty much got the dinner the night before, 
you have the full day and then you travel back. So that's about 48 hours we found was taken out for each interview. Um, with everything going virtual, 75, um, while it's a lot, it's something that actually could be done in a fourth year, um, definitely not recommended, but certainly you know, clicking on for a half day of interviews is a totally different thing. Now, when it comes down to ranking, uh, one of the things that I know that students struggle with is how to rank big name programs that uh, may be considered more competitive. Mm -hmm. How do students, uh, how should they think about this? So I think it has to be based on your, your specialty. Uh, so for example, you may have a big name institution that is not really good at your particular specialty or is not um, prominent uh, in your specialty. They may not even have a department with your specialty. So I think it's very important to really align what um, the, the prestigiousness of the actual program um, is at your, at your institution that you're picking. Uh, that, that's an important thing. Uh, certainly, if you don't rank a program, you will not match in that program. So if there's something that will cause you significant regret, uh, make sure it's on the rank list. And then there's consultation that you probably need to do about where on that rank list it should be. Uh, certainly, if you are not willing to go to a program, you definitely should not have it on your rank list. We had an example um, where somebody, she actually was interviewing for family medicine. She put a program in OB at the bottom of her rank list in a specific location, and she matched into that OB program when her primary subject area really was um, family medicine, and that was a problem for her. Uh, she she regretted it. She got she got her first OB choice, but she didn't get family medicine. Mm. Now, how would you apply kind of your same philosophy to a student who considers, you know, his or her dream program or reach or pretty competitive, but who got an interview? How do they rank? Uh, how should they think about ranking that compared to other, uh, maybe more similar or more reachable programs? So I think if a program actually offered you an interview, definitely you need to rank them, that's for sure. And um, I, I think that fear is a poor counselor. So if you are not ranking someone because of fear um, and they've already offered you an interview, I think that's that's a good, a good sign. One thing for sure, programs are actually not allowed to tell you where they ranked you. So uh, I think there is a certain amount of comfort that people think, oh, you know, this program said I'm definitely a shoe in. Um, they can change the mind at the last minute and that's their purview. And so that's why they're required not to, to state those things. Um, it's a difficult it's a difficult thing. We should have good counseling as to whether you know you have um, what it takes um, to, to be at that program. Um, but uh, certainly if it's your dream spot, it should be on your rank list if they offered you an interview. So just a question for that. Is there ever a reason to leave a program off your rank list if you've interviewed with them? Absolutely, absolutely. If you um, did your interview and their values did not align with yours, if there were misogynistic or racist comments or ignorant uh, questions that were locked your way, that's a problem because that gives you an insight into the culture um, that maybe it was just that interviewer, but that interviewer was able to, to um, thrive in that space to the point that they're actually interviewing outside candidates and that that's a problem. So that should be a red flag, certainly if it's your top choice and that occurs, you know, doing some additional, um, you know, some additional research, uh, possibly uh, talking to um, alumni of the program. You know, those are other opportunities. So let's say that you uh, you've ranked uh, one of your programs first. What do you think about sending a letter uh, with the intent, uh, you know, to that program to let them know kind of that you've zeroed in on that particular one? So that's a great question. When I interviewed back in, in 95, uh, yep, I sent a letter to every single person that I you know interviewed with and, and each one was tailored specifically to the interaction I had with that person. Uh, but things have gone sort of in a different, in a different way. Um, a lot of program directors are rubbed the wrong way um, with that. It's certainly not a letter of intent, even a brief you know, a brief thank you can sometimes go the wrong way. So um, I would definitely um, be deliberate about determining if, do they have a policy on this or not? If they have a policy against you sending information uh, after the interview, absolutely adhere to that. Resist the urge to send a thank you note. Um, so again, I, I would find out. Um, usually they'll be able to give you some idea about whether that's an acceptable thing to do or not. 
All right, Dr. Edgy, time for you to take your crystal ball out. Uh, you said, you know, seen uh, over the past few years, everything, when you look at the upcoming match, do you think it's going to be any more difficult or easier uh, than the last couple of years? And if, uh, if it's going to be different, what's driving that? So I think, um, it de- again, it depends on the specialty. So for example, ophthalmology um, actually went ahead and only offered 15 interviews per candidate. So they put a ceiling on that, um, which was very important. Op- um, OB and ENT have gone ahead and um, used preference signaling. They're, they're um, a situation whereby a, a candidate can actually express their serious interest in a program. It doesn't obligate the program to um, to express that same feeling. Um, but I so I think there's some new nuances that are in this interview cycle um, that will change um, the process. Uh, you know, definitely having everything be virtual. Um, I think levels the playing field. And despite the fact that the pandemic is sort of coming to a close, um, we found that having virtual interviewing actually has leveled the playing field. And so equity is an issue that has not changed even though the pandemic has changed. So I think that virtual interviewing may be something that's here to stay. And I think uh, because of that, um, we have some challenges. Number one, USMLE uh, went to pass bail and that was a, a metric that was used by program directors, not a good metric um, to, you know, to assess their, their applicants. Um, so they'll be looking for other things. And especially, you know, again, if you think of, you know, getting a huge number of um, applications, uh, it's very difficult to sort of do screening and decide you're going to, how you're going to holistically approach on um, the situation. Uh, regarding the testing, we know that USMLE scores are not an indicator of whether you're going to be a good clinician or not. And so they should not have been used in the first place as as markers. But we do know program directors usually try and pick some metric to at least narrow down the large pool. Anything top of mind in terms of those kind of criteria that folks are looking at, uh, given that the pass fail is now in process? Yeah, it may mean that the can is kicked down the road and they're looking at the next test that's out there, um, US only step two as an option. The other thing though is, um, you know, making sure that um, we're doing holistic reviews. So that would mean, what is your leadership um, experience been? What has your uh, engagement in your community been? All of these other metrics that are actually better predictors of how um, physicians are actually going to, to be when they get done. I know this is a, you know, obviously very stressful time. The good news is that uh, about 80% of medical students typically match with at least one of their top four choices. And so yes. uh, that's, you know, those are, are, are pretty good odds, but there are always some uh, who don't match. What would you right. say to medical students who are in a situation right now where they haven't been offered any interviews? Mm-hmm. Yes, I definitely a stressful time. There's no question. Usually, you know, your associate dean of students should be able to, to provide um, support directly boots on the ground in the institution. Uh, but never give, give up hope. There are so many stories where um, folks have actually gone through and, and we know that 96% of applicants do end up matching within the subsequent year. The question is, how do you spend your next year um, as you go ahead and try and either um, boost your, your CV? Um, do you do an MPH? Do you do research? Um, I think it's just important to make sure that the time is not wasted. Um, but rest assured that the majority of people who, the vast majority of people who go ahead and not match the first time do end up matching. Dr. Edgy, thanks so much for being here. And all you medical students out there uh, in your fourth year, we're thinking about you. uh, And for all those that are gonna be coming to this in uh, the coming years, just think about a lot of the leadership opportunities that the AMA offers and a chance for you to really show uh, commitment to medicine and your patients. Uh, Thanks for being here again, Dr. Edgy. Uh, For more resources to help with the journey toward residency, visit Frida, that's F-R-E-I-D-A dot A-M-A dash A-S-S-N dot org, which not only gives you access to Frida, the AMA's residency and fellowship database, but also our Road to Residency video series and other helpful content. In the description of this episode, you're also going to find a link to the AMA senior news writer Brendan Murphy's podcast series, Meet Your Match as well as a registration link for our Physicians of the Future virtual summit that takes place January 28th and 29th. 
It's a great place to connect with other students and get more advice. We'll be back soon with another AMA update. In the meantime, you can find all our videos and podcasts at ama-assn.org slash podcast. Good luck to all of you that are going through this year's match. I'll look forward to seeing all your posts on Facebook. Take care. Thank you.